come to worship our Lord and King this morning, we remember that we are part of his kingdom of that great sin among us. So let's stand, if you're comfortable to do so, and sing our first hymn, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's great song. <coughs>
words of preparation. They saw one who was worthy of blood, calmed his raging wrath, to free our brain, inspire our breath, and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before we come to people's processions, let's just take a moment to be quiet and to ignore the distractions that are happening. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins. Be our advocate in heaven and bring us to eternal life. So let us confess our sins and heavy things that we have done, firmly resolving to seek God's compassion and to live in love and peace with all people who pray to him. God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from wrongs that we have thought are mindful of what we say and do for the sake of sin and without quality. Forgive us all that we have offered and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all Make way, make way for Christ the King. So let us stand and give her a hymn and sing this song.
Roman page page 64. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit speaks of God's people in accordance with the will of the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to the purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed of the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called also justified those he justified he also glorified what then shall we say in response to those things if God is for us who can be against us he who he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things who will bring any changes against those God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who who was raised to life, who is at the right hand of God and who is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? It is, as it is written, for the sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through he, him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor the power, neither height or depth, or anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God, that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please, if you're able, would you stand for the Gospel reading? This is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about... 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again... The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. And this is how it will be at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where these will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes. They replied, he said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his house of his storeroom, new treasures as well as old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Good morning, do please be seated. 
Thank you, Emma and Caitlin, for the readings. Merciful God, we thank you for your many blessings and for this opportunity to meet together for worship, study, and praise. May my words be acceptable in your sight and fruitful for those who have ears to hear. Amen. Amen. Now, you may have noticed that the readings over the last three weeks have all been around the theme of parables. And it strikes me that for the first two years, two and a half years of the ministry of our Lord Jesus, he rarely used parables. And then he switches. He does a complete turnaround and only ever talks to the crowds in parables. Why? And what does this mean for us today? Well, let us try to work it out. To do this, we need to go back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 13. And here we see the words, that day or that same day. Why is that pertinent? Well, if we go back and look at chapter 12, we can see that this day is, in fact, a very significant turning point in the ministry of our Lord Jesus. It's the Sabbath, and our Lord Jesus is once again healing the sick and arguing with the Pharisees. But this is no ordinary Sabbath, not like the Sabbaths that have gone before. In Mark 3, 2021, we are told, Then he went to a house, probably Peter's, but a throng came together again, so that Jesus and his disciples could not even take food. And when his kinsmen heard it, they went out to take him by force. For they kept saying, he is out of his mind, beside himself, deranged. This was his own family saying this about our Lord Jesus. That must surely have caused our Lord Jesus to pause and consider. Those who knew him better than any other human, telling everyone, he's bonkers. And as if that's not bad enough, something else very important happens. The Pharisees decide to double down. Almost always a sign that your case is not based upon truth. They accuse our Lord Jesus of doing what in reality they themselves are doing. They accuse our Lord Jesus of doing the enemy's work for him. The Pharisees make a very, very serious accusation against our Lord Jesus. They make the claim that he is only driving out demons by and with the help of the prince of demons. This is an extremely serious accusation that if allowed to spread unchallenged could conceivably have destroyed the entire ministry of our Lord Jesus. But challenge it, he does. Challenge it, he does. And we must assume very effectively because we never see it used again after this. Our Lord Jesus makes the obvious point that a kingdom divided against itself must fall. There would be no point in the Prince of Demons expelling his own forces. He also points out quite tellingly that if this accusation is, accusation is true about himself, then how much more true would it be about those same Pharisees who claim to also drive out demons and heal the sick? But then our Lord Jesus goes on to make an extremely serious point to the Pharisees possibly a response, <coughs> excuse me, provoked by this extreme move by the Pharisees. And it is indeed an extreme move. Because make no mistake, this was effectively the Pharisees going nuclear in today's parlance. People today tend to just read this passage and breeze past it. But in reality, what they are doing is calling the Lord our God, the enemy, in an attempt to destroy his ministry and cling on to their own earthly powers and positions. They are putting, effectively, the Lord our God into third place behind the San Sanhedrin and the prince of this world, our real enemy. Breathtaking, once you realise the connotations of what you're reading. So how does our Lord Jesus respond to this outrageous claim? In Matthew 12, 31, we see, he says to them, Therefore I tell you, every sin and every blasphemy can be forgiven men. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not and cannot be forgiven. Denying or insulting the Holy Spirit in an attempt to maintain or bolster your worldly position will never be forgiven. Our Lord Jesus is telling the Pharisees that they've gone too far. They've overstepped the mark in their desperate efforts to discredit him for the purpose of securing their own positions and institutions. They have completely turned the truth 180 degrees around. 
And this is a lie. They know it to be a lie. Because we see from John 6, when Nicodemus visited in the night our Lord Jesus, in John 3, 1 to 2, we are told, Now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler among the Jews, who came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know and are certain that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And yet here we see two years later the Pharisees saying, you are from the devil. We don't really need to wonder why the Pharisees are following this strategy and trying to discredit our Lord so Jesus so desperately. We've probably all been there to one extent or another. That point in your faith journey where you may be forced to choose which way you are going to go. Stick with the worldly goods and comforts or follow the path your prayers and your faith are indicating. Commit to that calling or stick with the overtime at work. The very fact that you're sitting here today demonstrates your good judgment. The Pharisees are looking at an entire societal structure which they believe to be under very serious threat from this man who is doing such marvellous signs and miracles and they are being forced to choose. Indeed, we know from when Jesus was being uh, interrogated by the Sanhedrin, the high priest Cephas made the statement it would be better for one man to die than that the whole of Israel be destroyed. They choose wrong. Disastrous is so for them. So momentous developments on that day. And it's not much of a stretch to surmise that our Lord Jesus knows that he will have to change tack. Because the Pharisees refused to recognise him and repent, and the people refused to commit. We know from the readings of the last few weeks that from that day onwards, Whenever our Lord Jesus spoke to the people, he spoke only in parables. In verse 34, it tells us that without a parable, he said nothing to them. Why? Why parables? Could it be that there is an element of judgment, and almost certainly to my mind, a measure of mercy here? First, we look at the judgment claim. We know from Psalm 72, it says, I will open my mouth in a parable in instruction by numerous examples. I will utter dark sayings of old that hide important truth. A parable is a method, a tool of teaching. Most good teachers will use it. And it's where you use a story that parallels the truth in order to make it more understandable to your audience. Or at least that's how it usually works. For two and a half years, our Lord Jesus has been speaking to the people in the crowds and in the synagogues, explaining the scriptures straightforwardly. He has used what we today call expository preaching. He reads from the scriptures and then simply explains in simple, straightforward language what that part of the scripture is trying to tell us. From this day onwards, he switches to parables. By preaching in parables, our Lord Jesus is deliberately excluding a sizable majority of those who are listening because he knows they won't understand it. Why? We're told in Matthew 13, 10 to 12, then the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he replied to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has spiritual knowledge To him will more be given, and he will be furnished richly, so that he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. The riches of the rewards for those who endure are beyond description. The greatest prize in the whole of creation. Everlasting life in the presence of the Lord our God. We get to stand in the presence of the Lord our God and sing his praises. We get to walk and talk with our Lord Jesus and eat at his table. We get to meet the Holy Spirit. What will you give to win that prize? The consequences for those who reject the Gospels are too terrible to contemplate. Oblivion. So there is an element of judgment from this day on in the ministry of our Lord Jesus. By speaking only in parables, he knows that the great majority of those listening will fail to understand and be saved. But why? Well, the hard truth is that the people and the Pharisees, they've had their chance. And what a huge opportunity it was. Hundreds of years of reading the scriptures. 
They've had John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness for years and baptising thousands. They've had two and a half years of the ministry of our Lord Jesus, living among them, performing so many miracles that the Apostle John tells us in John 21, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. If they, if they should all be recorded one by one, not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Day after day, healing the sick, bringing back the dead, explaining the scriptures with such wisdom, such knowledge, feeding the hungry, telling everyone who he is and why he has come to live amongst us. And still the Pharisees and the great majority of the people remain focused on their earthly problems, their mundane existence. The fallen world is still their primary concern. The ministry over Lord Jesus is still basically nothing more than a great show, entertainment, nothing to justify changing their behaviour or their lifestyles or their belief systems. They still refuse to believe what they are seeing and hearing in preference for what makes them comfortable. The crowds will still keep coming. Everybody loves a good show. And miracles and free food will always fill the theatre. But from now on, only those chosen and called by the Lord our God will grasp the message with any hope of clinging on till the end. God does not count heads. God reads hearts. But where does the mercy aspect come in? Let me try and explain. We know that the Lord our God is a loving God, but also a stern and wrathful God. Wrongdoing, if not repented of and never repeated, must be punished. Sin cannot survive in the presence of the Lord our God. And this is why he sent us his only son, to take our sins away from us and upon himself, in order that they could be paid for by him, because we could never hope to pay ourselves and survive physically or spiritually. So our Lord Jesus switches from straightforward exposition of the Gospels to speaking in parables, knowing that the great majority would no longer understand. Now we understand the parables, but don't forget we have the privilege of living after the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus the Christ. We have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. These people at this time did not have that advantage, that marvellous gift. Our Lord Jesus has seen from the first two years of his ministry that this majority were primarily interested in what was in it for them. Judgmental, I know, but let's face facts. In John 6, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see the crowd pursuing our Lord Jesus across the Sea of Galilee after the feeding, the day after the feeding of the 5,000, and catching up, with him in, in, ha, catching up with him in Capernaum, where he tells them bluntly in John 6, verse 26, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. So this is where the mercy comes in. If I knowingly cause you to sin, if I encourage you or deliberately cause you to do something wrong, haven't I sinned just as much as, if not worse? Haven't I simply increased your culpability, your guilt? and therefore the severity of your judgment. If our Lord Jesus keeps preaching the gospel to the people in understandable terms, and they keep refusing to listen and repent, then doesn't that mean that their sin is only increasing every time they refuse to hear the message? So how could our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, act in a way that increases their sin, thereby deliberately blocking their salvation? Because isn't that what this is all about? Salvation. Isn't salvation our one great hope, our ultimate goal? If our Lord Jesus didn't come down from heaven to be among us in the dust in order to lead us to salvation, to save us from oblivion, then why did he come? What could we offer the creator of the universe that would cause him to undergo the cross? There is nothing we can offer the Lord except our belief, our faith, our living sacrifice. And the wonderful, marvellous thing about this is, he is doing it for our benefit, not his. How great is our Lord, that he cares about us all, even those he knows we reject his gospel. How great is our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Phil. So let us stand, if we are able, to declare our faith in God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in one God, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You please be seated for our prayers of intercession. In the church Bible readings these last weeks, we have heard Jesus speaking in parables to call us, the people, to expect the kingdom of heaven. We are not to be separated from the love of Christ. Today we hear parables of pearls, seeds and fish as Jesus explains the promise of what can be expected. The promise of the kingdom to come is made to us right now. As people of the kingdom, we approach God today in prayer. So let us pray for the world, for the church, for those we love and for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us treasure your world like the pearl hidden in the field. It seems at times that we have lost respect for the wonderful gift of your creation. The green fields and the harvests, seas of abundance and rivers of refreshment, the clean air and space to breathe. Your wonderful gift is now threatened by an environmental crisis. Why does our living in your world have to be so contentious? We bicker and argue over space and resources. The strong gain power over the weak. There is no harvest for the poor. We pray for the people and for the creatures of the field and we show kindness and respect for each other and for all nature. May we treasure the world you give us and let us give everything of ourselves so that we may obtain the kingdom of heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your church be like the mustard seed grown into the heart of the people. Let it grow in the good ground of the message, giving of its shade and its protection. May it provide the refuge and shelter that comes with hearing the word of God. We give thanks to all who preach the gospel in this place and to each of us as we live out the word to our friends and family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those we love. Like the fish in the parable, may we throw the net of salvation around all those for whom we care. Say the names of those for whom you have concern quietly and expectantly in your heart right now. They may be unwell. They may be worried or maybe even feel lost. Pray for their restoration in the kingdom that they may rejoice in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for ourselves and for all the doubts we have, the misgivings and the lack of trust we express in the world around us. 
these are the moments when we have averted our gaze from you. Lift us from our melancholy and renew our spirit. Release us from our insecurities. You are a forgiving God and when we seek you are always willing to lift us to a new relationship with you. We are reminded from our epistle that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We are predestined. We are called. We are justified. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now please stand if you're able for the peace. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. So let us share the sign of peace. And so we remain standing for our offertory song, which is, Oh, the mercy of God.
The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth. For by the breath of your mouth, you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of angels in heaven, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love, made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation. Loving us to the end, he gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise again and raise with him in glory. Amen. Lord, we believe. On the night he gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Lord, we believe. Therefore, we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption, Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Look with favor on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free and fill your church with power from on high. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with St. Andrew and all your saints at the table in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ, our Lord. By whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. 
as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The body of Christ, broken for us all. The blood of Christ, shed for us all. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving.
Kayak
we say together the prayer after communion. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life. By the power of your Spirit, keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So before the notices and the final blessing, we're going to sing again. And it is, build your kingdom here. So another one for the instruments. Be seated for our notices. Indeed, the last hymn's words speak volumes. Build your kingdom here. We're trying to build a kingdom here. So, have a look at the notice sheet. Messy church picnic for all families. Come along, please. On the 12th of August, starts at 3 o'clock and finishes at five, bring your own picnic. There will be lots of arts and craft and games and worship and sharing together. This afternoon, we have a come and see session 
for all of those who would uh, or, or are thinking of having their child baptized or maybe are even thinking of baptism for themselves. Come along to Holy Cross, come and see what baptism is all about and what you will be promising. A couple of other things. Holy Cross is open at 11 o'clock for tea and cake. I think they had um, quite a few visitors from uh, people who were using the playground over there uh, this week. Um, all of you are invited along to there. Um, please come and share in that space together. And then on Friday, our first of the family fun begins at St. Andrews at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, there isn't any joyful noise. Just bring along your children and have some fun together. And I think that is it. So please stand for the blessing. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.